Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast. I am your host, Nico Perino. And as you know, every other week, we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. For today's candid conversation, we're going to talk about a man whose name has become synonymous with censorship. His career led to the confiscation or incineration of more than three million pieces of allegedly obscene material, and his campaign against immorality and sexuality had the unintended consequence of laying the foundations of a First Amendment bar in America. Yes, that man is the late Anthony Comstock. He was the founder of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, and in 1873, he successfully lobbied the United States Congress to pass the Comstock Law, which made it illegal to send obscene, lewd, or lustful material through the U.S. mail. Our guest on today's show is the author of a new book about Anthony Comstock and his Comstockery. That author is Professor Amy Warbell, and she teaches art history at New York City's Fashion Institute of Technology. Her new book is titled Lust on Trial, Censorship and the Rise of American Obscenity in the Age of Anthony Comstock. On April 24th, Professor Warbell and I met at the Fashion Institute of Technology to discuss the life and legacy of the man at the center of her book and how that legacy still lives on with us to this day. Professor Werbel, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Nico. It's a real honor to be here. Well, I think we should start with the basics. And I think we should start by telling our listeners who Anthony Comstock is. He is the subject of your book. Yes, absolutely. And I've been working on Comstock for about 10 years. He was born in 1844 in New Canaan, Connecticut, and into a very devout evangelical uh, family. They were Congregationalists. And these were the descendants of the original Puritans who had come to Massachusetts and migrated to Connecticut. And so he grew up in an area that was pretty much a theocracy, meaning that the church ran everything. The municipalities were basically the parishes. And so that's the environment that he comes from. He uh, ended up serving in the Civil War very briefly, didn't really see too much action And then... Where in the country did he serve? He served in northern Florida, actually. Um, Traveled quite a ways. (laughs) Yeah, his brother, Samuel, his older brother, had uh, been mortally wounded at Gettysburg. And Anthony Comstock came in as a replacement for his brother, which was pretty common. But by the time he mustered in, it was late in 1864. The war was close to ending. He got shipped right away to sort of swampland in northern Florida. And this was the 17th Connecticut Regiment. They actually saw interesting uh, you know, moments at the end of the war when a lot of Confederates were surrendering to the Union Army and saying that they never supported slavery. And uh, and then at the time of the assassination of Lincoln, there was uh, a lot of sort of um, anti-Confederate sentiment. And, and there's interesting things that happened, but Comstock is, you know, just wholly concerned with evangelizing. This is his life's mission, is to spread the word of the Lord. And so the only thing he writes about his Civil War service is that he does things like pouring out his alcohol rations in front of the other soldiers in his unit, which makes him very unpopular. And then he's constantly trying to find some minister who can deliver a Sunday sermon, and he does some of that himself. And he's passing out Bibles for the American Tract Society. And you think he was a true believer and not just a moral posture. Well, no, I really do think he is a moral believer. And I also thought if I'm going to write a book about him, Mm -hmm. I'm going to take him really seriously. And I think that's great that you brought that up because a lot of the people who have written about Comstock have just assumed that he was this hypocrite. And that was based on a lot of the discussion about Comstock during his lifetime as well. You know, if you set yourself out to be a moral exemplar, you make yourself into a big target for people who would question your uh, true motivations. But I think he really was motivated by deep faith 
And you can see that from... His diaries. Uh, what yes. What you say about his diaries. He's constantly praying. He's constantly repentant. Uh, he sins and he uh, is just horrified by his own sins. And he really sets out to, I think, uh, make himself worthy of salvation in the eyes of the Lord. And that has a very particular focus on sexuality. Like early in his diaries, he's he doesn't use the word masturbation, but he's talking about, oh, you know, in the eyes of the Lord and um, in private he sinned and he's so upset. And um, it's, you know, he doesn't articulate exactly what that is, but then he sets out to prevent other young men from the sin of masturbation, which he thinks is caused by arousal from, you know, literature and dirty pictures. And so that's, and that's what he said led him to masturbate, right? Was this seeing well, these pictures or hearing these stories or that was his first biographer's take on it? Well, he, he talks about that there were certain things that came into his life as a child that he can never forget. Things that were seen once can never be forgotten and that they exist in a chamber of sin within the heart for the lifetime. And so that's the language that he uses to talk about his own childhood. Do we know what those things were? Were they significant? And so was there like abuse in his family or was it just that he stumbled across a story that might have been pornographic in nature or an image that might have been pornographic in nature? Uh, Do we know, is there something deeper there that well, we don't? We, what we know is that there was a lot of pornography that circulated even in rural areas like Connecticut uh, in the 19th century because there was basically no enforcement whatsoever of obscenity laws. I mean, what you, was it, Fanny Hill was one yeah, of the Yeah, Fanny Hill, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure was the most popular uh uh, pornographic text. And there were also lots and lots of photographs. You know, the joke about photography is it was invented in 1839 and pornography was invented in 1840, basically. Like, And this is a very typical story of new technology. It gets put to erotic use pretty much in instantly because there's always a profit motive. So, you know, putting two and two together, we know that he becomes obsessed with pornography for his entire life, I mean, his entire career. And when he, he's writing about his own child and things that came into his life, there's no evidence that he's writing about being sexually abused or anything like that. It really does seem like he saw pornography as a young clerk in Connecticut. You know, he grew up as a farm boy. There wasn't money. He worked on the farm, and then he worked as a clerk, um, went down to the Civil War, came back worked it was in these environments all the time where things were being sold and traded and we know that pornography came north from new york city most of it was produced in new york city in the antebellum era and uh went north with the trains and with the ferries and arrived at places like general stores where he worked and spread from there so um it's interesting in your book the the common belief, I guess, at least within Christian circles at the time, which I guess would be most circles at the time, was that masturbation was bad for you. Yeah, absolutely. It had, bad, had bad health effects. Yes, it was associated not only with moral turpitude and, you know, dying in the fires of hell, but with cancer, with um, heart attack, with circulatory problems, with lassitude that it could take away men's energy by sapping the strength. I mean, that this was all a product of the sort of second great awakening starting in the 1840s. And these were, these ideas were spread in uh, health manuals, very popular health manuals. So the, this you know, very unscientific by modern standards science is sort of spreading at the same time that these evangelical messages about the danger to boys' souls of masturbation is also spreading. So and at the, the same time that the technology is making access to pornographic materials way easier. Yeah, absolutely. It just gets cheaper and cheaper with every evolution of printing processes that makes it possible to produce more and more and more, uh, you know, cheaper paper, cheaper ink, cheaper printing technologies. Another thing that, you know, so much of my book is a story about unintended consequences. Yeah, and I want to get to those. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot so of questions many. here about those. Well, is, it's a story know, of censorship. It, right, it is the story of censorship. It is a story of unintended consequences. And the 
there are tariff acts that are trying to prevent, you know, rubber goods and pornography from coming in from Europe, I mean, starting in around 1842. And but then it just starts to get produced in the United States because now, well, okay, it's too dangerous to ship it from overseas, which is still happening. But there's a great incentive for publishers to kind of ramp up in New York City. And then the railroads make it possible very cheaply to sort of spread this from New York City out throughout the country. Um, so all of these are forces that Comstock will battle for his entire career, which is that it just gets cheaper and cheaper to produce. It gets cheaper to circulate around society. But I, I take him at his words and think he was a true believer who throughout his career was motivated by these pretty unchanging religious beliefs in the danger of pornography. And he was an evangelist. He, you know, avowedly wanted to save people's souls. And Is this, that what he wanted to do as his profession, even from a young age? Well, yeah. I mean, the the story he circulates about his childhood is that when he was a store clerk in Winnipeg, he kills this rabid dog that's threatening all of the, uh, you know, the t good town folk, and that he is morally courageous enough to stand up to this rabid beast. And that's how he talks about pornographers. Like, he starts, that's like when he's 17, that he's going to spend his entire life being the courageous one who stands up to the rabid beasts of the world. And that is the framework through which he sees his mission. Um, and, and that's what he does. And he ends up in, he, I mean, one of the really odd things I puzzled about was why does someone who is so devout who wants to live a pure life, moved to New York City in 18, by 1868, he's in New York, so probably moved there in 1867, and New York is probably one of the, no, not probably, is one of the filthiest, <laughs> most, um, you know, delinquent places on earth, you mm -hmm. know, filled with prostitution and pornographers. and Especially after the war. Especially after the war, it's flooded by veterans, um, young men who move to the city in large numbers, like Comstock, looking for work. And he starts right away on a kind of vigilante crusade. So he's working as a clerk, but then after work, he's rounding up, you know, street peddlers who are selling pornographic photographs. Uh, he's bringing them to the police station and then watching them just leave through the back door and trying to close down saloons that are operating on Sunday. And he does all this. Um, he's not getting paid to do it. He's just doing all it's of this. It's his hobby. It's, it is. It's his, it's his hobby. He's an amateur vice suppressor. <laughs> so, um, But he's doing it in an interesting way. He's not going out and trying to convince people that their vices are bad for them. He's going out seemingly to try and punish them for their vices. And you actually make the note about this in your book. He he doesn't take the same approach as like later evangelists would, which is to try and 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 cure people, cure in quotes, through outreach. He's doing yeah, it through the exactly. through the force of law. Right. And what you're talking about really is the evolution of social Christianity, which happens around the turn of the 20th century, which is this idea that people are going, that Christians are going to reach out and be inclusive and offer alternatives. But Comstock is very much set in this earlier mode of Christianity that uh, assumes that Christ is an angry figure and that you know, to be a soldier of Christ is literally to be like a policeman on mm -hmm. earth to enforce God's laws. And that you can think about going again back to the Puritans and burning witches. I mean, this is the model of an angry, vindictive uh, Christ, and you serve him by weeding out the impure in, in your society. And the, it's really kind of ludicrous that he thinks he's going to purify New York City, which, you know, we live here now. <laughs> and I yeah, it's still as, not purified, no, although it's, it's gentrified, you can say that. Yeah, but I don't think that goes with <laughs> That doesn't because, count. No, it definitely. That doesn't count. No, not but the same thing. But he had allies in his early crusade. I guess crusade is the right <laughs> term yeah. there. Uh, he had YMCA, which... A lot of people don't know, stands for Young Men's Christian Association. Yes, and at that 
period of time, it was an evangelical Christian organization. And a lot of the directors of the New York City branch of the YMCA had been very active in the Civil War. Uh, in the American Tract Society, they gave Bibles to soldiers, and Comstock was involved with that work. So he already kind of knew who they were. And um, when I looked at the records of the YMCA, they had been involved in trying to suppress obscene publications since right after the Civil War. They were housed in some rental um, spaces and there were concert saloons with prostitutes openly soliciting. There was a lot of um, Was prostitution legal at the time? No, not technically, but it, the, nobody enforced it. I mean, yeah. the, the police were completely corrupt uh, such that the all of those sort of obscenity crimes were basically an opportunity for graft. That is, that was this once a, you these the Tammany Hall days. Yes, absolutely. And you had um, so a lot of the police force was basically, you know, it was all patrimony. You know, you'd get jobs for being connected to this Democratic mob boss or that Democratic mob boss, and uh, the brothels would just or in the concert saloons. These were places which were openly you know, offering sexual services basically would just pay off the police regularly. So when, uh, you know, the, the gentlemen who were the directors of the YMCA were very upset about this, and you can see in their committee minutes that they're trying to figure out how to clean up, you know, their neighborhood, and a lot of them are landlords too, and they this is lowering their property values, and it's also just bad. So, but they don't have anybody, you know, these gentlemen can't go into the basements of the Lower East Side and, you know, directly confront pornographers because they're way too respectable. So there's this meeting, this incredibly fortuitous meeting that happens in 1871 when Comstock is supposedly he's down at the tombs, which are this uh, municipal prison, and uh, the, the police officer who's, you know, commiserating with Comstock on how yet another person that he's brought there to be prosecuted is just released, says, you know, I think the YMCA is actually trying to do something about this. And so um, Comstock writes a letter and goes uh, you know, up to the YMCA, delivers it, and, you know, within a week, Morris Jessup, who's a very wealthy um, Christian industrialist, shows up at his workplace and basically hires him to be the roundsman for this Committee on Obscene Literature of the YMCA. Uh, so at that point, he gets a, a huge salary boost, and he is, from that period of time, from 1872, a professional vice fighter, and really the first professional vice fighter in American history. He creates this job. And then, again, talk about accruing power. Really, the 1870s is a time when he's building up his power. Um, the YMCA backs him to go down to Washington, D.C., and he's carrying suitcases of pornography and contraceptives and sex toys, most famously dildos, that he spreads out on the uh, tables in the vice president's office, in Schuyler Colfax's office, to show to the senators to try to get them to support a bill, the most comprehensive bill ever written in the United States that will outlaw obscenity uh, sent through the United States mail. So this is federal, so they draft this as an amendment to the Postal Code. And it becomes known as the Comstock Law. It's a tool laws. for censorship for a right. you know, century after that. Right. Well, it's a tool for censorship, but if you think about it, it's the federal government, so their domain is actually pretty limited, right? The, yeah. the, postal, ser the uh, postal Service and D.C. and territories. But then that law becomes a model for state Comstock laws. So by 1900... I think it's more than 40 states have basically adopted this federal language, which is outlying, and it's an enormous number in my book. I go through all of the different things, even things like paper, you know, mm -hmm. just this enormous, you know, list of things that can be suppressed, and then adjectives. So what is obscenity? Obscenity means it's criminal, but how do you define obscenity? And they start just listing adjectives, you know, indecent, lewd, lascivious, um, and it goes on and on and on. And that's where we start to have this very vague law that will be enforced in a way that really um, just 
exacerbates the power imbalances that already exist in the United States. So it's going to exacerbate patriarchy, right? Many of these laws are really enforced to the detriment of women in terms of sexual sexual health information and access to uh, birth control, reproductive services. Yeah. Uh, Margaret Sanger is a subject of your book who fell right. afoul of yeah. the Comstock law. Yeah. And I think it's very kind of evocative of the that aspect of patriarchy that Comstock comes into the newspapers, really walks onto the American stage uh, during his prosecution of Victoria Woodhull, who is the first woman to run for president. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the namesake of the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Alliance, I think. Is the yeah, name. yeah. Like, there's still a lot of Woodhull followers <laughs> out there. And then he dies in the middle of the trial of William Sanger for circulating his wife Margaret's pamphlet, Family Limitation. So his these kind of bookends of his career both involve women who were radical, who were speaking up for free love, who were speaking up for women to have control over their own bodies. And then, of course, between those, you have 43 years of a really huge docket of things that he is working on suppressing. Um, and it, it, what, what struck me in your book is one of the ways he would uh, justify going after some of these individuals was through ordering their materials through the mail to himself and then saying, oh, you know... Uh, it was made available public. It was in commerce, and now I can go after you for it. Exactly, and he actually invented. What a jerk! <laughs> well, he and that that's one of the things that fascinated me because uh, in terms of learning about the law, because by training I'm a history of art professor. Uh, Here at the Fashion Institute of Technology, yes. or uh, in your building right now, or one of your buildings, there's yes. many of them. My interests have always been very interdisciplinary, and so I was interested in how visual culture responded to law, but I had to learn a lot about legal history, and so I ended up researching things like entrapment. Like in the 19th century, entrapment is not a defense. Um, entrapment was just how Comstock figures out that he can use this federal postal law to get his defendant. So for Victoria Woodhull, for example, he ordered the newspaper, Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly, he goes to Greenwich, Connecticut, and he orders it under a fictitious name. And once it, you know, crosses those state lines and through the U.S. Postal Service, or at least it, it only has to travel through the U.S. mail for him to bring a conviction in federal court. Mm -hmm. And um, that that case actually ends up getting thrown out, but um, he uses that a lot. And right from the beginning, Americans say, hey, this doesn't seem fair. And they're not using the language of entrapment. They'll s speak to things like, the, doesn't this violate the liberties of the citizen? Or, you know, they'll accuse him of um, uh, spying and surveillance and ha and they're discussing how can citizens trust government if government allows them to be targeted in this way that seems so devious. And so the, you know, one of the things that fascinated me is, is before the case law is written about in the legal textbook, the concepts are really developing all through Comstock's career of Americans articulating, not using 20th century language, but using pretty precise language to say they feel as though they have the freedom of expression and they feel as though they should have due process and they feel as though there are techniques that Comstock is using that violate the idea of the sanctity of the home or, um, the, you know, uh, searches without warrants, all these kinds of things that are later, you know, in the 20th century going to be very much central to the evolution of First Amendment law, but all those con all those concepts are really being um, fleshed out during the course of Comstock's career. Yeah, you say in the book that it, Comstock can be credited with developing the First Amendment bar. Absolutely, the the first organization, the National Defense Association, that's formed in 1878. Brings together. This is before the Free Speech League, right? Yeah, yeah. before the Free Speech League, which um, became the ACLU. Yeah, actually. exactly. So, and and so we have the National Defense Association, eighteen seventy eight, which is very upset about the prosecution of free thinkers and free love advocates, and these were um, some of them were atheists predominantly. Some of them were espousing uh, kind of open relationships and sexual equality between men and women. All these ideas were 
radical at the time. They were definitely not, you know, center ideas. They were, were still definitely kind of radical. Um, yeah, I mean, less certainly less radical now. But they were prosecuted under the Comstock laws for uh, obscenity, and lawyers come together to defend those uh, targets of Comstock's prosecutions, basically under the idea again that. This is, they're not using the language of the First Amendment. The First Amendment does not extend yet to uh, state cases. But they're, uh, they're basically saying that this is an abrogation of the liberties of the citizen. And then that organization kind of peters out. And then we have the National Defense Association, which is formed in 1902. And then you start to have lawyers that are really um, making huge progress in building the defense tactics of First Amendment bar. So you have people like Theodore Schroeder, who writes the first t uh, textbook about obscenity law, and he's working with Clarence Darrow, who is defending many of Comstock's uh, targets in the early 20th century, uh, Hutchins Hapgood, Lincoln Steffens, um, and Emma Goldman, who is really, I think, pretty pivotal for bringing together the idea that what is termed obscene speech and political speech are really are in some ways the same thing and need to be both need to be vigorously defended in order to achieve a society in which expression is really free. Um, that organization, again, also peters out. And then there's the National Civil Liberties Union. I think that's 19... 15 and then 1920 is the ACLU. And there's like an unbroken chain. But the, those initial lawyers, they all cut their teeth. They're basically just following Comstock and defending the people that he targets. And so vice suppression and the representation of these defendants really grow together symbiotically. And that's why I say in the book that... Comstock's campaign really carries in it the seeds of its own demise. So what were the arguments these lawyers were making? I know you say you don't have a legal background, but at the time, the First Amendment had, didn't really have any teeth. That no. wouldn't start happening until around 1919. Uh, and even if it did have teeth, uh, it wasn't incorporated to the states through the 14th Amendment until much later. So what, what were the arguments they were making? Well, probably the most powerful one was what we would now see as the sort of slippery slope argument. Well, if you're going to say that this is obscene, then what about that and that and that? So with the Woodhull case, she was... Uh, she wrote a story about Henry Ward Beecher, the famous minister of uh, Plymouth Church in Brooklyn, that he had, there were these rumors going around that he had slept with one of his parishioners on this little red lounge. It was very uh, saucy scandal. And she wanted to prove that, that free love, in fact, was practiced at the time, even by the most prominent um, New York City moralists. And so that people should stop accusing her of, you know, advocating something that's so outrageous when, in fact, this is happening. Well, this is all what the time. got Margaret Sanger in trouble too, right? Well, I mean, she was circulating information about, um, you know, birth control techniques, which actually don't oh, use. Oh, so this is Wood, uh, Yeah, this, this is Woodhall. Woodhull. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. just Sorry, thinking, right? Confused. No, right back to the beginning. This is really because this is the first time that. Uh, you know, this is right around the time the Comstock laws are passed in D.C. So right from the beginning, the attorney is basically reading out loud from these classics like uh, Aristophanes and Hudibras and reading these things out loud in the trial and saying, if you allow that this story in this newspaper is obscene, then what about all of this tradition of literature? So I would say that's a really big theme throughout. So when there's theater cases, for example, well, if you're going to prosecute this vaudeville act, well, what about the black crook? And what about um, the white crook? And what about, you know, all these other plays that are going on? And so that's um, a really prominent defense tactic. And then the entrapment thing comes up, basically, that uh, people are induced into committing crime. So if Comstock, for example, as he did, would go to a brothel and pay to see some really obscene floor show, well, he had induced the criminal behavior that he then rounds people up for committing. So that's another big complaint. Uh, and then the idea of, 
you know, that he's on the take is another thing. And then that gets back to your initial question about was he actually on the up and up or not. And right from the beginning, defense attorneys are accusing him of basically being involved in corrupt activities and uh, and that the organization itself, because the w- <laughs> one of the really bizarre things about Comstock's organization. I don't think we said the name yet. The New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. Yeah. So to go back to right after the Woodhull trial, so we're still in 1873. Which is when the Comstock Act was right, passed. Right. Comstock Act one. is passed right in the winter of 1873. And um, then, you know, Comstock goes back to New York and the YMCA basically kicks out this committee for the Committee for Obscene Literature. They basically say, we don't want to be involved in this. And this is when the YMCA basically says, we want to create opportunities for young men to, you know, we want to, they're, they're building gymnasiums, they're building libraries, they have uh, musical concerts and slideshows about traveling around the world. And they Their want, techniques change. Yeah, they, they basically turn make this turn towards social Christianity. They say, we don't want to be involved in prosecuting. We want to be involved in offering healthy entertainment. So they kick out this committee and the committee becomes incorporated in New York State as the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, and Comstock becomes secretary. And at the same time, he, uh, at the federal level, he is given an appointment as an inspector for the post office department. So he has authority under the post office department to seize mail and so forth. But in New York State, this society is getting half of all the fees that are collected. So if you are uh, convicted of circulating pornography and you have a $500 fine, $250 goes to the New York Society it's for Expression Perverse Advice. incentive. Right, exactly. It's to so, find pornography where. Exactly. So that's one of the things defense attorneys are saying is that basically this is all a racket to funnel money from, you know, innocent citizens just exercising their, you know, freedom of speech and that um, – Comstock is inducing people to commit crime in order to collect these fees. And so that is a running uh, commentary um, by defense attorneys. And, you know, so much of this is covered in the newspapers. So these lawyers aren't reading about this in textbooks. They're just reading about, like, almost verbatim coverage of the trials often in the many, many newspapers that existed at the time. It's a great reminder of the importance of the press uh-huh. <laughs> and having a vibrant press that can really get out and cover um, cases. Well, you write in your book that Comstock confiscated or incinerated, burned more than three million pieces of obscene material during his career. And he had a pretty high conviction rate, although not as high as some of his early biographers yeah. uh, insist. So it's it's interesting. You write uh, in your dedication, you you dedicate your book to the defense. For the defense, quote. yes. For the defense. <laughs> Um, right. And, you know, I get the sense that you have an appreciation for the defense throughout the book. How did you come to that point of view? What what inspired you, I guess, to write the book and then also to focus so much on the defense? Well, I think it comes from my training as an art historian that really my perspective started with having written my uh, dissertation on the artist Thomas Aikens, who was fired from his job in the mid 1880s um, for basically using photographs of nudes in his teaching and in his artistic practice. And he was also making photographs of nudes with his students. It was very controversial at the time. But I really felt like he defended what he was doing in a way that made sense to me and that he wanted his female students to have the same exact education as his male students. And if he had limited the circulation of these photographs just to men, nothing would have ever happened because nude photographs circulated amongst men all the time. That was homosocial behavior and most of the pornography that was sold in the um, years after the Civil War was sold in places like barber shops and saloons and these, um, you know, concert saloons and peddled by boys and men, two men on the streets of cities. And so, you know, the the idea was that women needed to be protected from any kind of sexual information or sexual images. And that just, you know, I think... I sort of resented that sort of patronizing attitude that said that women couldn't 
handle the same education that men had. And that wasn't just in the art world. That was also in the medical world as well. It was used to keep women out of medical school for many years, that they couldn't handle seeing nude bodies. And so th that... Um, that experience of working on Aikens led me to think more deeply about why, you know, he was so self-righteous. And Comstock's name came up in the uh, board of directors minutes from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts that fired Aikens. They were worried they were going to get raided by Comstock. And I started to, you know, just look around for what was written about Comstock and realized there hadn't been a biography since, a major biography since 1927. There certainly hadn't been a biography with new information. And 1927 so, also 1927. happens to be the year that what Mae West was sentenced to a... Uh, what uh, hard labor on Roosevelt Island yeah. for a play sex? Yeah, I guess I think it was 1927, April 19. So this month. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's true. <laughs> um, so I I started to you know I didn't really know what I was going to come up with when I started looking for uh, just the coverage in the newspapers about what's going on and looking at the experience of artists who were prosecuted under Comstock laws and photographers. And then I just really became more and more um, impressed with the courage that people had in standing up to Comstock and asserting their rights as Americans. And I really believe that if there's anything that makes us exceptional, it is our First Amendment, was in, which is, has within it an, an exceptional faith in the ability of citizens to carry on uncomfortable conversations and have the outcomes of those conversations lead us to a better and healthier democracy. So for me, that ability to have these full conversations um, is really about our uh, understanding that pluralism is the great strength of our nation and what Comstock was trying to do and there's still many people out there today trying to do the same thing was to view sort of Christian morality as the you know guidepost for American culture when in fact we were very specifically not founded as a Christian nation uh, we were founded as a nation that was, you know, as flawed as all of it is and as, as hypocritical as all of it is. The, the great promise of America is that we could live up to the ambition of being a secular, uh, open society. Um, all of that really depends on our levels of education, I really believe. Of course, as a professor, I think that's a huge part of it is that we need to teach uh, our um, young citizens, how to have uncomfortable conversations, and also, I think, impress upon people that with that extraordinary uh, gift of the First Amendment also comes extraordinary responsibility, and understand that we can be free to say what we like, but we also have to carry the consequences of what we say. You write in your book that Comstock dramatically changed American law and culture in a way that still resonates with us today. I want to talk a little bit about that today part. Obviously, he changed it uh, in a way that created the First Amendment bar and sort of galvanized the movement for free and open expression. But in, in talking about Aitkins, uh, you mentioned that a lot of the animus that motivated uh, the, the efforts, what he got fired from his job, yes, he uh, were, were motivated by women... The idea that women need to be protected yeah. from the effect of these images. Do you think that is still with us today in a different way? And I think to the pornography battles of the late 80s and 90s, Andrea Dworkin and uh, Catherine McKinnon, their fights with uh, Nadine yeah. Strawson at the ACLU, yeah. but they were coming at it from a different perspective that uh, – what was their argument that pornography was a form of sex discrimination uh, and violated federal law? And they actually were successful, if, I, if I'm recalling correctly, in passing an, or tr passing an order in, ordinance in Indianapolis that was subsequently struck down by the Seventh yeah. Circuit uh, that would have more or less codified a new Comstock Act, essentially the idea being that pornography can be, violate the federal civil rights law. Yeah, well, I I think that, you know, the, the thing I would say is that many of us share common cause. Um, 
I would like to see a United States that has fewer violent images. Um, I believe in the power of images. I'm an art historian. It, uh, it would be crazy if I didn't believe in that. But I don't think that government is the right place to bring about a, an improvement in our literary or visual culture. And I think that if you look at what's happening right now with these private platforms, right, which are moving to make new changes, some of which are good, some of which are mm. Facebook, have, Google. Exactly. Yeah, we these, talked about them in a previous podcast. Right. The, well, that's happening on a private level. And we would refer to that as social censorship, that basically dollars are – uh, following values. And I would encourage everyone to have their dollars follow their values. And, you know, if there's a platform that they feel is, is um, you know, promoting values they don't share, well, get off of it, you know. And um, that commercial realm, the marketplace of ideas, I think is the uh, the best place for these battles to be fought because we – you know, what you can see in the cautionary tale of the Comstock era is that when government is empowered to enforce morals, it becomes uh, an arena for demagogues to use these vague laws, which are necessarily vague, uh, in order to kind of exacerbate power imbalances. And I think that uh, one of the lessons is, you know, be careful what you wish for, because if you think that you can pass a law that is only going to suppress the the speech you don't like, just wait, because it'll come around to, you know, kick you. Um, and And I think now is a really great example of that, because a lot of people who three years ago would have happily, you know, wanted the Obama administration to be in charge of enforcing morals. Uh, would not be so happy to have the Trump administration enforcing morals. And it's a great example of how things can shift and how um, basically empowering politicians creates opportunities for grandstanding mm -hmm. and I think for obfuscation. I mean, now this, um, the new um, Child Sex Trafficking Act. SESTA FOSTA. SESTA yeah. FOSTA. I mean, who in their right mind would not agree that sex trafficking is one of the truly um, tragic, uh, you know, ongoing. Um, you know, nightmares in our society. And yet, we're going to see a lot of unintended consequences. The, this new law strikes me as very similar to the Comstock Act in being very broad, very vague, and really open to a lot of people making kind of big speeches and, and with the idea that if, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, if you get rid of the advertisements you could limit the trade. But the Comstock example shows us that even when you get rid of the advertisements, the underlying conditions didn't change. So pornography goes from here to there. It goes from New York City. To, it spreads out across the country when New York City is really um, heavily prosecuted. And then it, it goes to new technologies. And that's a very old story. And the truth is that prostitution, you know, re became reduced around the turn of the 20th century as the product of a lot of really big social changes, one of which was women having more opportunities to come into the sphere of employment, you see the numbers of women who are actually, you know, gainfully employed in legal professions grow at an exponential rate. And those kinds of alternatives are, you know, providing women with um, the opportunity to support themselves and their families with living wages is far more powerful, I think, you know, I, I, it's not just me, but a lot of people, you know, agree that those kinds of um, opportunities create much more real change than just the surface. Cleaning up the surface is what censorship accomplishes. What were the leading feminists in the late 19th and early 20th century thinking about pornography? Did they see it as the evil that Comstock thought and they just thought that the – the that Comstock's way of, of addressing it was wrong and in, in, in the same way you kind of say it creates unintended consequences or did they really feel as though it was a avenue for female liberation well the 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 issue is really or are they not talking what, about it? no i mean the the thing is what hmm. what did pornography mean at that time and that's where the overly broad thing came in because i do think if Comstock had really just limited himself to photographs of explicit sexual acts, 
then this whole, uh, you know, resistance may, might not have happened because you don't really have people in the 19th century standing up for the photographers who are making images in brothels of sex acts between prostitutes and, you know, clients. Um, but what happens is that, that Comstock is rounding up things as obscene, like descriptions of techniques for preventing conception, you know, which, again, don't use Margaret Sanger's pamphlet because it's really inaccurate. But there's there's a lot of sexual health information that's wrapped up in it. And also this um, sort of free love literature, which, you know, Victoria Woodhull is at the beginning of that movement. But people like Emma Goldman also buy into the idea that women ha equ have equal rights to uh, sexual health and to sexual pleasure, and they shouldn't be forced, for example, within marriage uh, forced to have sexual relations with their husbands when they don't want to. They're, women have no legal rights at that period of time. And basically, the, you know, the, the radical view is that marriage is a form of sexual slavery. Um, and that the idea of free love is that both uh, women and men should be able to love who they want and should be sort of equally li liberated from these constraints um, which have been placed upon women really through the paradigm of Judeo-Christian uh, religion. So there, the, there's a lot of radical ideas wrapped up in there. It's, you know, in, infused with socialism and, um, but, but that, that version of radical feminism basically says that marriage is on a continuum with the uh, slave trafficking um, or sex trafficking. So, you know, I think we're not there anymore. I mean, it was a very radical argument, but they that's the kind of thing that's being swept up in obscenity prosecutions. And they want to be able to circulate their opinions as radical yeah. as they are. And eventually it was what some or most people at the time would consider traditional art as well was getting swept up, right? It, it would, Comstock's downfall was ultimately that he pissed off the artists. Yeah, I think, yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad you brought it back to the art because I think that's absolutely true is because that's where the New York Society for the Suppression of Ice starts to lose money. I mean, the, the wealthy, you know, uh, folk who are supporting, you know, giving annual donations to the New York Society for the Suppression of Ice, they could care less about Victoria Woodhull or Emma Goldman or Margaret Sanger, but they really care that their art dealers are being prosecuted and they really care that their homes, which in many cases are filled with classical statuary of nudes and images of, uh, you know, nude Venuses and so forth, that that art is being condemned as obscene and sort of swept up in these raids. And so that's where the donations really begin to dwindle. And the pivotal moment, I think, is in 1906 when Comstock raids the Art Students League of New York and confiscates a magazine that the students had produced uh, called the American... Um, student of art, and it had reproductions of life drawings by students. So these are, you know, drawings of nude men and women with full frontal nudity. And, uh, you know, that was swept up as obscene. But the artists made a really good case that if they were going to compete with European artists, they needed to have the same ability to study from the nude figure. They wanted to be portrait painters. You need to understand the anatomy of the body. And so, again, the the press was just terrible. Comstock becomes just the literally butt of jokes. <laughs> and um, is Well, you can compare them to the, the, uh, the vandals in the Middle Ages who were um, taking off right. genitals from sculptures. Yeah, the iconoclast movement. And that, that has cropped up over and over again. And again, it all relates back to these ideas about lust and Adam and Eve and the fall of mankind being due to um, you know, forbidden fruit and lust. It's all wrapped up together. And I think actually a, a, a good modern example of that is, you know, John Ashcroft when he had those nude figures in the Justice Department covered with curtains. And then he became a cartoon character, really just mercilessly caricatured for being this kind of knucklehead Puritan. That was very much the the um, cast that was put upon Comstock. And he, from 1906 to the end of his career, he Judges and juries just do not take him seriously at all, and those cases start to just get 
thrown out really regularly. Um, and one of the moments that really struck me was when he's actually, he's punched several times by a defense attorney in court and the judge does nothing about it. Wow. And Comstock's trying to get the judge, he's trying to bring a, you know, a civil suit and, and they're just like, forget about it. We don't care. You know, you got what you deserved. <laughs> that's a, that's a far cry from his power and influence in 1873. Yeah, he, well, one of the things you make, the points you make in your book too is, uh, you know, of course, censorship backfires. As a result of Comstock's crusade, pornography not only becomes more available, it also becomes more explicit, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it goes underground. And this is this is the concern about, um, you know, SESTA-FOSTA is that it's going to be harder to find. And that definitely happened in terms of the, that explicit pornography. It also becomes much more what we would consider to be obscene. Because out of the um, public eye at this point. Exactly. Because it has to be. Exactly. It's farther from the public eye, but also the profit motive goes up. That if you're going to go out of your way to see a show and you're going to take a risk, it's going to be that it's going to get chicer and chicer to see a better really- Better be good. A more, exactly. It better be good and, it's, and gets more outrageous. Uh, the other thing that happens is that because of the the- you know, censorship makes things chic. And so you have many, many more artists, theater producers, film producers, the uh, people who are making early phonograph recordings. They are trying to walk that line. They really want Comstock to complain about them. So they're trying to get hit that edge where it's just obscene enough that Comstock's going to get into the newspaper saying how horrible it is. But maybe not, you know, maybe just get thrown out of court with a $25 fine because it's going to drive audiences to their product. And so and that's the story still today. I and mean, yeah, that's why exactly. Richard Spencer goes to college campuses. That's why Milo Yiannopoulos goes to campus. I tell, I, say, I tell these activists all the time, if you want to get rid of these opinions, if you think they're harmful to society, the last thing you want to do is try and censor exactly. them. It's the sand effect. Exactly. And that that is absolutely one of the takeaways from the Comstock era is that Comstock ended up just publicizing and raising the value of the things that he attempted to suppress. And, you know, by the time you get to early film, I think it's something, this statistic is something like a third of the films produced in the first decade of film were censored subjects where the they basically are just taking whatever has been shut down in municipal theaters and making it into a film because people know those titles and they'll go to the movie theater to see those particular sketches. And people like what's salacious. Exactly. Christopher Hitchens uh, yeah. gave a speech in Canada one time where he tells the story of Samuel Johnson, the first uh, lexicographer, for, created the first dictionary. And once he did it, it was a big monumental achievement at the time, but he was waited upon by uh, the the most prestigious, famous women in in London. And they came to him and they said, you know, Mr. Johnson, we must commend you on your achievement here. And we must also commend you that you didn't have uh, uh, the moral failings to include bad words in your dictionary. And Samuel Johnson said, well, I commend you for knowing where to look. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's yeah. a great story. It's yeah. like, that's what people like. I mean, the yeah. more, the more uh, you censor things, the more interesting it becomes. Yeah. I want to close up our conversation of Comstock here by talking kind of about the evolution of obscenity in the United States. It's sort of become uh, a legal word that, that doesn't really have any meaning at yeah. this point. I, you you talk in the book about the, the was it Potter? The, the Just you said, I'll know it when I see it. Right, yeah. And then the, there was a great retort, I forget uh, who, whom you quoted, uh, who said, yeah, uh, but you have to see it to know Well, it. actually, that, that's what I said is that- um, Was that you? Yeah, no, that was me. That, <laughs> that was a great line. Oh, thank you. Well, but basically what well, I said is- You say it better than I could. <laughs> that when you look at the role that artists played in this period of time between, you know, 1873 and when we get up to 1920 in the ACL, you really take the ball and start running, that the role artists play is that, that you know, you, you can't know it until you see it. And all these people who are- trying to find that bright line. The bright line is the line between what is legal and illegal, right? And all of the, many artists and, as I said, filmmakers are trying to hit that line. 
And that's when we can know what it is. And that line, where it is, what's acceptable in terms of aesthetics, in terms of subject matter, and in terms of the context in which things circulate and who can see it, whether men, is it just for men or is it for mixed company? Is it just for women? All of all of that context for that bright line helps us see the power structure in society. And so as an art historian, I am really interested to put artists back into this story of the First Amendment and to show how important they were um, in, in creating the concept of uh, expressive freedom and in, in those years leading up to, you know, the, the big major court cases of the 20th century. Yeah. And we're still living with Miller v. California is currently the yeah. standard for obscenity. Right. And actually I do talk about the fact that, well, contemporary community standards is what the attorneys are talking about right from the beginning of the Comstock Act, which is, hey, you know, I took my family to see this show. I mean, that's the kind of thing they're saying right from the 1870s. They don't say contemporary community standards, but that's exactly what they're talking about. You know, look at what people are wearing on the streets. You know, look at what's published in the newspaper. You know, how is my client's um, production any different than what we see all the time? So it takes like 100 years to get from 1873 to, I think that's 1972, I think. No, I think it was actually 1973 was. 1973, right. It's 100 years. Yeah, yeah, it's 100 years to basically have that early defense attorney, you know, you know, vindicated in, in American, you know, in the Supreme Court. <laughs> but that, that line will live with me forever. It, Potter, you know, I'll, I'll know it when I see it. And you're saying, <laughs> well, you can't know it until you see exactly. it. It's a great so, line. Thank you, artist. <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I talked a little bit before about third wave feminism and its concerns over pornography. There is, does seem to be a, a modern movement toward neo-Puritanism, at least insofar as the treatment of art today. And I'm thinking back to the controversy at the Met last year surrounding mm. uh, Balthus, the, yeah. the, uh, the French artist, and the, the petition, yeah. I think, sound by eight thousand people to have yeah. it removed from the Met. Uh, for those not familiar with the the work of art, I believe it depicts a young woman in kind of a suggestive pose. Uh, her underwear is showing, yeah. And the petition asked for it to be removed and replaced by a. It could be a similar painting, but but a female artist, yeah. Or and you know, to be fair, the petition it, it also did say to have contextualizing label mm -hmm. that would acknowledge that Balthus, you know, was, um, you know, may, may have had purring at interests in young girls and that, you know, you know, some people basically either want sort of a trigger warning and, and actually trigger warnings have been really popular in American museums for at least the last 20 years where, you know, if you're going to have a display of Maplethorpe explicit photographs, it's very common now that you can't see in the gallery and there's a sign out in front saying, you know, there are images inside that may be, um, you know, for mature audiences only. And I don't have a particular issue with that as long as the work is available. I think the issue that the Balthus case raised um, was both that, uh, you know, the, sure, the curators could look at that label copy. Um, you know, I think if the work is there, we can talk about it. So if the work is there, it raises issues that, again, are productive of conversation. Um, but one of the th issues in my book that really comes out is this question of expertise and the devaluing of expertise. People like me who spend, you know, a decade getting a PhD, these are like all the curators in the Met and so forth. And are, you, are we now going to have labels that are basically written by petition of people writing into, you know, yeah. blogs or whatever. Um, I think that, that those of us who are professionals um, should take every opportunity to listen to um, viewers of artworks and to take advice into consideration. But at the end of the day, I, I completely supported the um, curators of the Metropolitan Museum of Art to make the decision about what to display and how to contextualize it. Yeah, one of my concerns, especially with art, is uh, you know, these sorts of movements to contextualize the art, uh, to, to try and dictate how it should be displayed, mm -hmm. uh, prevents the art from standing on its own merits. I, When I was much younger, I took a class at the, the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. uh, it's a beautiful collection of Gorgeous. you know uh, early modernist, impressionist, post-impressionist mm -hmm. art. And the one thing about the Barnes collection is they they try to make the art stand on its own merits. No and, labels. And, no labels. You don't even know who painted <laughs> yeah, right. it. I mean, everyone knows what a Renoir looks like, but that you know, unless Renoir had it on his frame, you, mm -hmm. they're not going to tell you because yeah. they want the art to stand on its own merits. Uh, so I, I'm always reluctant with paintings to to um, load the dice, yeah. so to speak, and 
question it could extend to other arts as well. Or do we need to do something with uh, Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita mm-hmm. or um, Alice in Wonderland, Land, yeah. lit, written by Lewis Carroll, who has right. potentially had some interest in younger women, yeah. much younger women. Right. So there's 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 um, also just that sort of scholarly concern with what it does to how we approach the work. Yeah. I think it's it is harder than ever to teach this work, and I um, I'm grateful to be in you know an academic community where we are talking all the time about how to respond to the pressures of uh, from coming from people who legitimately want our society to be more equitable and more inclusive, and to reduce the speech and the images that make some people feel welcome and other people feel un- unwelcome, and that you know bring up. Um, you know, uh, past uh, trauma that people have experienced. And, you know, I, I kind of honor all of that. And I think there's some really interesting uh, things that are happening in the art world in response. One of them, for example, is to have different ways of uh, contextualizing information using technology. So, for example, you could have a gallery display that has rel- relatively little sort of text, but you're using things like podcasting where people can go around and they can use their phones to listen to different voices from the community, different perspectives um, that are available to be listened to, but, you know, people can access as much of it as they want to. Um, and again, I, I don't particularly have an issue if there are, um, if there's some text sort of saying that there are mature images or something like that. Um, so I think giving, I think having the work on display creates the possibility for a conversation. So, you know, again, I don't think censorship works. I think that more better speech is the answer to difficult speech. I would say I, I didn't even know about Balthus until this right, controversy exactly. arose. Exactly. <laughs> and that is the absolute proof of the thesis of my book is that the, the effect is to, you know, n- now we've all seen that image. Like I, I don't it's, think I would have made it. What's it called? Teresa Dreaming or something? Yeah, I, I forget the title. That sounds like it's it. But um, right, exactly. It puts the work before us, which ultimately then you know we can have a conversation about it. Which I always think is that is the marketplace of ideas. That is, I think, the idea that the the um, Madison Jefferson had in thinking about, or at least one of the ideas that they had in thinking about first amendment as, um, as a, uh, principle that would be inclusive. Um, and so I think we can include all of these conversations. I wouldn't censor the young women who were circulating that petition either. Um, but I do think at the end of the day, we do need to stand up for the value of, um, expertise and to, you know, except that we are not going to have sort of museum exhibitions that are sort of, you know, just like crowdsourced. <laughs> yeah. So before we close up here, I know we're at an hour. I want to ask you one more question, okay. kind of a curveball question, not even on the subject. But All at right. the end of your book, you said you spent a year in China. Yeah. And you talk about how struck you were uh, by the censorship that permeates that society, especially within its educational institutions. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because we Absolutely. just did an episode about the Great Firewall of China yes. and their their techniques to limit dissent. So right. it would be interesting to hear your perspective having spent a year there as an yeah. American academic. And actually I went there really to, to just get the vibe of what it felt like to try to work and teach and live in, in, in a country that had pervasive censorship. And I wrote a book called Lessons from China, which was my last book, where I have a chapter called The People's Republic of Censorship. And I write about the terrible effects on the quality of education in a society in which people are constantly looking over their shoulder, constantly worried about who's overhearing what. Um, and, you know, the you know restrictions that come on things like libraries and databases, you know, the problem of accessing information in a society which is afraid of information rather than what we ideally are, which is open to all kinds of information. That is my American dream. But one of the things that really struck me um, is that when I went to China, I really thought, I was thinking, I'm going to learn about censorship, you know, as though what I learned about the effects of censorship in China would sort of directly inform my understanding of censorship in the United States. And I realized that actually historical narratives make a really big difference. China doesn't have some historical narrative of revolution, of rebellion. They don't mean they may have the words of the First Amendment in their constitution, which is pretty meaningless, but they don't have a tradition of free speech. And they never have. They can't look back 
um, at that. We have a very powerful narrative of revolution and rebellion and dissent that so that, you know, when you look at the 19th century, people are, you know, hey, I have free speech rights, you know, you can't take my, you know, you know, circ- my publication away and circulate suppression of my text. They have, uh, Americans have an understanding of what it means to be American that folds in this idea of civil liberties, of, of the, what we, you know, look at now as, um, you know, the first, fourth, and fifth amendments in particular that come up in my um, book. And so the, I don't think censorship works the same way necessarily. And I'm very careful to always say what we learn about American censorship is that it tends to produce more resistance than intended consequences. And I think, you know, my sense about what happens in China is that, you know, a lot of the people I met were sort of shrugged it off and said, basically, as long as the economy keeps expanding, as long as I can get a good job, you know, the harm, harmony is a word that comes up a lot. Like they were willing to accept some suppression of rights for the sake of harmony. And certainly the, the narrative there is these horrible, like the cultural revolution, like the, the turmoil and the, um, you know, the tragic outcomes of uh, societal upheaval in China are, th- I think, are very powerful narrative within Chinese society. So... Well, so they do, have a, they do have a history of revolution, but it's not one for expanding n- freedom. No, exactly. It, exactly right. And so that really helped me to understand how, you know, as a historian, um, how valuable it is for us to have Americans understand that um, the the power of those narratives, whether they recognize it or not, or it's, it's sort of lurking mm-hmm. in their vague concept of what it means to be American, I think that um, it's powerful, and we see it every day. And every time there's a, you know a, another walkout from school or another march, um, this is what Americans do. Yeah. And um, I was in my I was in my apartment today, and there was a protest outside. It was what like. One thirty in the afternoon. Yeah. Well, that doesn't happen in China. <laughs> yeah. You know, it can't happen in China. It surprises me, too, that um, Xi Jinping, the president of China, hasn't been more liberal, given that I believe his family was wrapped up in the Cultural Revolution, and he might have lost some family members as yeah. a result, or um, one of them was imprisoned or something. But he hasn't seemingly learned the lesson of uh, of censorship and, and persecution that yeah. you'd think you would learn from that experience. Well, unfortunately, they, you know, all of these dictators, the many dictators out there who, um, and autocrats who use uh, our example as a, sort of a cautionary tale, you know, they, they look at our present relative instability and basically say, look, you know, it doesn't work. And so, again, to preserve harmony, um, these are just the, the conditions you have to accept. And look what's happened to American speech. Um, and I, I think it's incumbent on us, if this great experiment is going to work, we need to understand the consequences of speech. And we need to understand the very complex um, factors that shape American speech and understand what the government should properly do and what should be achieved through social censorship and through dollars following values and counter speech, which is always, I think, the you know the best disinfectant is sunshine and counter speech. When you know it, you know when we see what we don't like, and I think Charlottesville was a great example of that of how many people became aware of white nationalism, white supremacy, and neo-Nazi movements through the horrible events in Charlottesville and you know, re, uh, dedi- you know, realize that's not me. And I think there's many, many, many more people who ended up on that side of that, um, you know, terrible, uh, um, you know, conversation. So, um, there's, this is a, an important moment in time to test whether we really can be, um, a pluralistic society, uh, that benefits and, become stronger through open conversation. Yeah. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Professor Warbell, uh, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Nico. That was great. That was Fashion Institute of Technology Associate Professor of the History of Art, Amy Warbell. Her new book is called Lust on Trial, Censorship and the Rise of American Obscenity in the Age of Anthony Comstock. And it can be found wherever fine books are sold. To learn more about the book and Professor Warbell's work, you can visit lustontrial.com. Before I sign off today, I want to note that there are still a handful of tickets available for the live debate 
hosted by Fire and the Comedy Cellar on May 8th in New York City. We're debating the question of whether there is a campus free speech crisis. As I mentioned on our last episode, the debate features Andrew Sullivan and Jonathan Haidt arguing yes, there is a campus free speech crisis, and Suzanne Nozzle and Jeffrey Sachs arguing no, there is not a campus free speech crisis. If you are in New York City at 7 p.m. on May 8th, you won't want to miss this debate, and you can buy your ticket today at ComedyCellar.com. This podcast is hosted and produced and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. You can learn more about So To Speak by following us on Twitter at Twitter.com slash Free Speech Talk, or liking us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash So To Speak Podcast. You can also email us feedback at So To Speak at TheFire.org, Or call in a question for a future show at 215-315-0100. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts. Reviews always help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, I thank you all again for listening.